Sundance Film Festival premiering our new film, Pandora's Promise, all about nuclear power, and the way to that. Well, Sundance is everyone's dream, isn't it? <laughs> I was um, premiering the film of uh, Pandora's Promise, uh, which, which I'm in and which I'm also writing a book for and which I did a lot of research for. So it's been my sort of, uh, I've been living and breathing this project for months now. But um, so, yeah, it was, um, you know, we were asked to premiere at the opening weekend of Sundance, which is quite an, quite an honor. The director, Robert Stone's had uh, at least four films there before, so he's very well known on that, on that circuit. But we were the main, probably the only in main environmentally themed uh, film that we're showing, so it was quite a lot of buzz about it. And what's the thesis of the film? Well, the thesis of the film is that everything you think you know about nuclear power is wrong, assuming you're against it, uh, and it follows the lives of um, five, six uh, key environmentalists who changed their minds about nuclear power, starting off being anti, as of course all environmentalists generally are, uh, but who changed their minds about it. Uh, and the main theme running through all of this is they did so because of climate change and because of the urgent need to provide carbon-free power for a growing population, um, which is growing in affluence as well around the world. So how, how you can provide carbon-free energy to a planet of you know, seven, eight, nine billion increasingly wealthy people, uh, and you, you can't do it with intermittent diffuse renewables. So you've got to have other options there, which which are zero carbon and which are scalable and uh, as environmentally benign as possible. And it turns out that nuclear is, is probably the best option rather than the worst. So going back a few years when you were anti-nuclear and indeed you were campaigning against, what were the arguments you used then that persuaded you to be anti? I, I wasn't anti-nuclear in anything other than a generic sense because I was an environmentalist. So I didn't ever, to my, as far as I remember, I didn't ever participate in anti-nuclear demonstrations. I never, so I didn't, I, I can't say this is an enormous road to Damascus thing because I never put much thought into it initially. Uh, it was just, if you're involved in a movement, you don't question all of the tenets of the movement. I mean, why, why would you bother? So it was, it was an unquestioned orthodoxy, if you like. I didn't give it any great thought. But, but there were arguments. Oh, yes. And the arguments are, uh, uh, I think, the argument which, is, which was made a lot of sense to me then and probably um, does to a lot of people now is about waste and about the long-lived nature of waste. <clears throat> and the idea that you're leaving, that by using energy today, you're leaving some kind of a legacy which is going to have to be managed by future generations. Um, and, and in fact, that was what really turned me, was, fi was finding out that that problem had technically been solved. Uh, and it was uh, with, with different kinds of technologies to what we've had in the past. Um, so that, that was sort of what opened my mind up. So it was, you know, I can say it's Tell a response to a changing and, situation. And what you discovered? Uh, actually, I was reading um, one of a piece of writing by Jim Hansen, the NASA climatologist, talking about fourth generation nuclear power reactors and how uh, new designs which are coming online potentially can burn nuclear waste. Uh, and leave a, a, a much diminished legacy of waste, both volumetrically and in terms of the half-life, so the, the period for which it remains toxic. Um, and in fact, if you compare that with conventional waste, I mean, there, there's toxic metals used to make solar panels, cadmium or telluride, for example. Uh, and, you know, if you say, what's the long-term plan for them? These, these don't have a half-life, so they will remain toxic forever, you know, until, until the end of the Earth. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we have, when you start to think about it in, in context, and you think about all the different things that humans are doing, all the different wastes and all the different management challenges we have, uh, this is one which is, uh, was A, not as bad as everyone thought originally, and B, at a technical level, has probably, probably been solved largely. Is this a technology people are using now, or just a future hope? Uh, it's technology that was designed originally in the 50s and 60s even. So this is about having fast spectrum you know, reactors. Uh, which which can then burn up the what's known as actinides, so the uh, the other radioactive elements along with uranium and plutonium at that particular part of the periodic table, and those are the ones that tend to have the the half lives which uh, leads to the waste remaining active for tens of thousands of years, and um, so they can be burned up in these in these fourth generation reactors, and what you have instead are the uh, the very short lived, so the very hot initially hot fission products like cesium and strontium and those kinds of things. But within, I think it's as little as four or five hundred years, the waste that's there is basically at the level of the original uranium ore. So it's, it's not like you need something which you have to have hieroglyphics on for future civilizations to read. Uh, and, you know, pretty much there's, there's a lot of buildings and human infrastructure which has been around for that long. And in, in, in casks, then it's not really going to go anywhere. You know, no one's ever been, I don't, to my knowledge, no human has ever been harmed by nuclear waste. 
And if you compare that with the waste from, I don't know, the aluminium industry or the coal industry or even the solar panel industry, you know, there's rivers being made toxic and people getting cancer and all sorts of things happening. So it's just, uh, I'm not saying it's, 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 it's perfect, but it's a, it's, if you take it in context, it's a lot less bad than a lot of other things that we take for granted every day. And why not renewables? Why not the German path of saying no to nuclear and really going for it in terms of renewables? You, uh, I don't think any of us would argue that you shouldn't really go for it in terms of renewables, and it's not an either-or situation. But if, because if you if you've got to, to generate what I think we use something like 15 terawatts of power for the whole planet at the moment, uh, less than two percent of that is coming from renewables, and that's after a lot of acceleration in previous years, and the amount of additional coal which is being used every year is more than all of the addition, all of the additional renewables. So coal is expanding faster than wind and solar and all that together at the moment because because coal is a, a good way to power industrial society. You've got millions of people living in cities, you switch on a coal-fired power station, bang, they've all got electricity. Um, wind and solar um, are geographically very specific and um, they need to be deployed over very large areas of landscape to, to to generate sufficient power, which is, means you've got to build a lot of infrastructure, um, both in terms of turbines and sticking panels in the ground and stuff, uh, and s transmission links and all the rest of it. Then you've got the intermittency problem. You know, there's a very long periods of time when you'd get pretty much zero power from wind and solar, and, and they do in Germany. So you know, when their power comes, is f essentially comes from coal in Germany still, and they've just opened new coal-fired power stations. So that situation will continue. They displace a bit of it with um, with solar, but. It's, it's not, so, so at the technical level, it's just not a believable solution to do, to solve climate change with renewables. It just, you really have to suspend <laughs> your judgment and your disbelief to believe that that's possible. And, you know, and I'm a, I'm a pragmatist. I want, I believe that climate change is sufficiently serious that we have to have a pr pragmatic approach to it, not, not an ideological one. And I think most people's commitment to renewables is ideological, not, not pragmatic. It's because they believe there's something good about renewables, not that they're actually particularly functionally useful which um, in, in many places and in many cases they're not. And certainly the amount of money that the Germans have spent on solar, it, it, you know, it's an it's a enormous achievement what they've done. They, they get 5% of their electricity um, from solar now. I think it's something like 27 gigawatts. You know, it's an enormous amount of solar power they've put in. If they'd spent that money on nuclear, they'd have a zero carbon economy by now. And in America, of course, they think gas is going to save the situation. So you're going to have a hard job persuading them to go nuclear again, aren't you? Well, nuclear is being displaced by gas because gas is so cheap um, because of shale gas. It's also displacing coal, so American emissions are actually falling, um, partly because of that and partly also because of, of, of renewables. So there's no nuclear being built in, in the US at all. Well, there's one plant, but it's not, it's not going very well. Um, so for, for all of this, financing is the challenge. Nuclear and renewables have the same financing structure in that you, they're very capital intensive. You have to spend a lot of money building a plant and then the fuel is effectively free, completely free in terms of wind and solar, but very low cost in terms of uranium. Um, but you've got to spend billions and billions up front um, in building the things uh, and they have a very long lifetime. I mean, nuclear power stations have already been around for 50, 60 years and the next lot could be around for a century after they're built. And that's a financing type structure that we just don't have in the modern world. Things are sort of 10, 20 years at the absolute maximum. So how you can get capital markets to fund that and what kinds of returns they've got to get to make those upfront investments is the real challenge. And it applies equally to renewables as it does to nuclear. So what's your hope for the film? What do you think it'll achieve in the book? Well, the film is, the film is intended to make people think. So it's not a propaganda piece by any stretch of the imagination. Um, if the nuclear industry had made a film, it would be very different to this. Uh, in fact, there's whole scenes when um, I, go, I, I go to Fukushima with the director and you can't go somewhere like that and not question your, you know, if you're pro-nuclear to start with, which I was, and I had my dosimeter and, you know, getting very high readings in certain areas. And we were also talking to, um, to refugees who've been displaced from there. So, you know, we, we wanted to challenge ourselves and it was very challenging. And there's a period in the film where I have, I don't want to give too much away, but I have a bit of a wobble. <laughs> and so I, ho I hope we dealt with that as honestly, uh, it, it, you know, not, not, not in a sense of trying to diminish the real problems which nuclear undoubtedly has had in the past. So the film is going to do what then? Uh, the film is going to hopefully convince people to reassess their orthodoxies, orthodox views about this. And it's going to challenge everyone. I mean, I would like uh, people who are climate change skeptics to see this film because I think part of them are 
Part of the reason people are skeptics is because they don't buy the solutions that are offered by the Greens, and so they just would rather climate change doesn't exist. And, and most climate skeptics are, tend to be pro-nuclear for some, just for, probably for historical reasons. Uh, and most climate change believers tend to be anti-nuclear. So in fact, it challenges both of them, but it also has something to offer. And maybe there's a kind of bipartisan type uh, way forward here where we can have low carbon electricity, um, which is acceptable to the, to the people who are currently disbelieving climate change. And what's the reaction been so far to particularly by the environmental lobby? Um, the, the reaction has been muted from the environmental lobby. There's already an anti-website been set up and there was people even handing leaflets out at the premiere. Um, so I don't think the, the, the true believers in the anti-nuclear movement are ever going to buy this. They're not, they're not the audience. I think the audience is, is normal people who assume that what the environmentalists have been telling them is correct and who would learn a lot by realizing that actually much of it is urban myths or at the very least been, has been exaggerated. And so the real, the real danger of, of not having nuclear power at all is that you, you can't solve climate change and we have another couple of degrees of global warming and we basically we trash the biosphere. And that's just something which we all fundamentally um, want to do something about. So it's, a very, it's quite passionate as well. You know, we, 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 have, we have a lot of, um, you know, we have a lot of commitment to the future and to having a positive approach to it. What's it done to you and yourself? Because presumably a lot of old friends are getting, uh, looking at you in a different light. Are you finding it difficult personally to make this move? Well, um, nuclear was only the beginning. I've had GMOs and everything since. And so there's a, there's a variety of issues where I'm seen as being a bit of a heretic. But I, I, just, I just try to, to orient myself by reading across a subject in, in lots of different ways. So I follow climate skeptics on Twitter, I follow anti-nuclear people, anti-GM people, pro. So I, I try and force myself to read things which challenge myself on a continual basis. And also I try and, um, s s you know, look at science in a way which I probably didn't before. Right, so science was our main orientating issue when it came to climate change. And I tried to apply the same sort of logic to, to, to other debates about solving some of these issues. And on climate, so climate change itself, is your position changing at all? Um, I don't think the fundamentals of my climate change position sh are changing, no. I mean, it, you, it would take a lot for the physics of greenhouse gas forcing in the atmosphere to somehow be revised and this to no longer be the problem that, that we thought it was. Uh, there are certainly issues about how sensitive the climate is to, 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 the, to the emissions of different gases, um, what levels of global warming we're seeing on a, on a year to year, you know, how whether the tipping points are real in terms of Arctic sea ice things. There was a piece of science came out that suggested the Amazon rainforest might be more resilient, but there's some things which have, which have got worse. Certainly we've seen the more rapid disappearance of the Arctic sea ice than the models predicted. Um, so I'm, uh, and, and driving all of this is the very rapid increase in emissions globally. There's not, I mean, there was a slight downturn after 2009 because of the economic collapse, but since then it's gone straight back up again. So we're, we're on the very top level of the emission scenarios which take us into the four, five, six degrees of warming. So in, in some ways I'm more scared now than I was five or 10 years ago. Because you used to say that even three degrees was pretty serious for the planet. Well, three degrees is pretty serious for the planet. That would take us to a, a level of warming which we've never experienced in our entire human evolutionary history. Uh, it takes you back to the Pliocene three million years ago. Um, and I think even that would, would irreversibly commit the major polar ice sheets to, to collapse over, a long, over long periods of time. But you know, we'd, 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 there'd be no such thing as a geographic coastline staying the same. It would be continually coming inland. So it's a, it's a you know, I, 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 that isn't the same as a, a civilizational apocalypse. Uh, but I just, I just think we don't know. If you think even now, I talk to farmers quite a lot and I say to them, you know, our, your farm is functionally shifting south if you're in the northern hemisphere by 20 meters a day in terms of the climate zones because of the rate of warming. That could double or triple. And, and already they're experiencing, I mean, in the US, there's been very serious droughts. Uh, fires season has changed in, in Australia and so on. Uh, and just incredible levels of heat. And that's with less than one degree of warming. So triple that and, you know, we're already in a very different situation. Do you think some pragmatists are privately thinking, well, it's going to be geoengineering, really, is the only way out of this, is I, we can't stop it? I know, I'm not, well, I don't know if they're pragmatists, but I know people who, who remain anti-nuclear because they think that geoengineering is, is what is going to save the situation. 
um, and they make that trade-off. And I think some of the proposals for geoengineering, depending on how you define it, would certainly work. You know, we know that um, what volcanoes do when they put a lot of sulfate aerosols in the stratosphere cools the planet off. Uh, post Pinatubo in the mid 90s, things cool down by a degree or so for a couple of years. So it's certainly possible to do that and it would be probably relatively cheap to do. You don't have to put a lot of sulfates in, in, the, in the stratosphere. And it, it, interestingly, what we're doing now is reverse geoengineering because we're cleaning up coal, uh, coal emissions in China and India and elsewhere. So in fact, you'd expect additional warming from that. And there's po possibly there's an argument, um, given that we're already altering the Earth's thermostat on a you know, day to day, week to week basis to putting some of that gunk in the stratosphere instead where people don't have to breathe it, but it still does the cooling effect. But I think uh, everyone would appreciate that that's a totally different argument. You know, you're, you're into a, a situation of trying to govern the Earth's system uh, without any political strategies for doing that. You know, what if the Chinese and the Indians and the US have a different idea of what temperature there should be? Or, you know, or the rainfall patterns change suddenly, or if, say there's a drought as we had this year and we'd been geoengineering for two years, who's going to take the blame for that? So it's, a, it's almost like manslaughter and murder. You've got to, somebody can be dead, but the intention is completely different. And once you start ge geoengineering, you can hardly stop, can you? Uh, if you? If you put a lot of aerosols into the atmosphere, uh, into the stratosphere, and you then um, continue emitting carbon dioxide and continue the, the underlying forcing, and then you take the aerosols out and they'd fall out very quickly within a matter of weeks and months, then yes, you get a very rapid amount of warming. So you'd have to, you'd have to continue it or do, or do something to stop, to, to reduce the emissions paths in the meantime. Um, but I don't, I, you know, there are some types of geoengineering which I'm more enthusiastic about. I think the ocean fertilization thing is well worth a proper look um, because there's large areas, there's a good use of solar power actually, large areas of solar power falling onto the oceans. There's nothing much living there, there's no algae. Put a little bit of missing nutrient, mainly iron there, and you get potentially um, drawdown of CO2, which from some of the science I've seen could be tens of parts per million. So, uh, you know, could turn the clock back 20, 30, 40 years in terms of our emissions paths. So I'm not saying that would work, but I think that that isn't as outrageous as some of the other ge geoengineering proposals I've seen, and it's probably worth a good look. Right. So overall, looking at the whole picture, you have two young children. Are you now a bit more hopeful about the future or actually more pessimistic? Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful generally, but just in terms of, my, that, I think that's my sort of personality inclination. And also, you don't find pessimistic people doing very much in terms of trying to, you know, so I think hope, being hopeful goes along with being a pragmatist. You've got, you, you believe that problems are solvable, but it does mean you've got to make trade-offs and you've got to recognize the realities of the situation and not make the perfect the enemy of the good. Um, so that's, I think, driven my <laughs> conversion on, on various things. But you know, there's so many things which are getting better. We're on the verge of eradicating polio. Um, the levels of, of extreme poverty have fallen by half in the last 25 years. We've met the Millennium Development Goal on extreme poverty five years early. Um, there's increased water um, and basic, basic health being provided across Sub-Saharan Africa. A lot of these countries have had rapid growth and have reduced their poverty levels a lot. So there's so much in terms of the human aspect which is getting a lot better with development. And I think we need to recognize that those trends should continue because the biggest killer at the moment in the world is not climate change, it's poverty by factors of a hundred or so. And so reducing poverty within the context of everything else we do um, is, is really the ultimate challenge. And how we can square that circle is what convinced me that we needed to really increase productivity of agriculture and increase the amount of power we produce. Okay, and when do we see the film? The film um, is, is just going through the negotiations about distribution now, as in February. And um, we'll probably be out in the US in theatres, as they call it, not cinemas, in um, midsummer, and then coming to the U UK in autumn and, and, else, and elsewhere in the world at that point. But um, we're not sure about how to, what kind of distribution model to go for, but I think it, it's got to be in the theatres and it's got to be something that um, ordinary people can go and see. And the book? Uh, the book. The book I'm trying, I'm really struggling to find time for at the moment, but I've, I'm only on chapter three and it's going to have five, six or seven chapters. But um, um, and, and I'm working on the publisher as well because I've got some funding to do it so I don't need to up front get a publisher, I can actually get the manuscript tidied up as, as well as possible. But I want it to be, to give a level of detail which you can't get into the film. So slightly, maybe that's my own inclination, but slightly more nerdy with some real numbers about what, what different levels of radioactivity mean and what, you know, some of the context that you, you, you can't get on something on a film which takes, you know, an hour or two. Well, thank you very much and very good luck with it all. It's my pleasure. It's been much more pleasant than hard talk. <laughs>